Today's guest is Krim Lechner. Krim is an Austrian drummer who has made quite the name for himself as a world-class metal musician. He rose to prominence as the drummer for the Polish metal band Decapitated. In fact, that's how I met Krim, in Atlanta, Georgia, on a summer slaughter tour stop, where Decapitated was headlining the Traveling Summer Festival. Mild-mannered and extremely polite, Krim's offstage demeanor was almost a direct contrast to Decapitated's onstage demeanor. That's not totally surprising, though, as many metal musicians who play in some of the most musically extreme bands are actually some of the nicest and sweetest people you could ever hope to meet. Krim is now the drummer for Greek metal legends Septic Flesh and is coming up on six years of being in the group. He also records music independently, available for consumption at bandcamp.com. Just search for Krim. You spell that K-R-I-M-H. Recently, Krim was at the Meinl headquarters in Germany for a video shoot. My colleague Norbert scheduled some time during his trip to Meinl to sit down and chat with me transatlantically. I really enjoyed my time speaking with him, and I hope you enjoy the podcast. I'd like to welcome everybody into the Meinl Radio podcast. Today, straight from Germany, we've got Krim Lechner here with us. Krim, what's up, dude? Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Correct. I'm at the uh, Meinl factory in Gutenstetten. It's just been uh, two busy days recording a lot of uh, cool new videos. So and now a cool podcast. How are you doing? I'm good, man. Things are, are cool over here. Well, that's not correct. Things are pretty hot over here in the southern yes. U.S. <laughs> but um, yeah, I have zero complaints right now. Um, cool. Man, I've got uh, a bunch of questions I want to throw at you and pick your brain about some things. So let's dive right in. So first of all, you and I, we've not had the chance to work together too much. I mean, we've hung out some, like at the Meinl Drum Festival. Um, Correct. You're in Europe. You're in Europe. I'm in the States. Uh, the last time I saw you in the U.S. was years back when you were playing with the Polish metal band Decapitated. And that was on a summer slaughter tour. But Oh, 2010. My first yeah, US dude. tour, to be honest. That was your first U.S. tour? Yes, that was my first U.S. tour. Wow. Yes, well, now wow. when we catch up, <laughs> when we catch up now, your main gig is you're with uh, a Greek metal band called Septic Flesh. And Correct. You're from Austria. Now, Decapitated was from Poland. Septic Flesh is from Greece. Have you ever played in a straight-up Austrian band? Um, I have played in some local bands, but nothing that I would say it was a band that was playing, you know, international shows. So yeah, I have, I have done my homework with uh, local bands from Austria, but, um, I realized that our scene might be too small to, you know, step out of, of the borders from Austria. We have a strong scene. It's not like this, but I knew that I have to go, let's say, to Poland, for example, to fulfill my dream. And um, so that's why, yeah, my first professional touring band was decapitated. And I moved to Poland for this band. And you still live in Poland now? No, that's not correct. Um, I have stayed around five years in total. It was always like a back and forth between Austria and Poland. Um, Austria has always been my home country. And even though I spent or I've been like five years in Poland, you know, I had uh, I had their place to live and back and forth. But right now I'm living in Austria again. Oh, OK. Um, yes. So now... I you're Austrian and you speak German as your first language, correct? Correct, okay. yes. And you also speak English very well. Um, ah, I try. I just <laughs> pretend. I mean, you know, the funny thing is I, I almost failed constantly in English. And all the English you hear now, I learned afterwards by, you know, traveling with bands, um, having conversations through the Internet, writing back YouTube comments. So this is kind of, or this was my school. <laughs> Hey, I mean, that's how you do it, real world, learning by doing, you know? Correct, correct. Well, so I have to ask, now, did you ever learn to speak any Polish? You know, it's a very difficult language. Um, so many Polish people told me, like, you know, it would be cool if you could speak Polish, but we understand it's a very difficult language. So I was like, all right. And to be fair, um, I can understand quite a bit. So this is easier for me. I cannot read anything because it's quite crazy. 
and I have this psh, ch, ch. It almost sounds the same, but it's not. And so I never really had the chance to learn it fully. Also, I have to admit that by not being so often in Poland, what I mean by that is I was on tour um, and with my band and with everyone else on tour, I was speaking English. So for me, talking Polish was never really necessary to do. So that's why my understanding, I completely immediately um, recognize if somebody speaks Polish, like I know this is the language, and I kind of get the context, but it's just too difficult. So I would say I speak just German and English, and that's it. Yeah, it was strange. When I was um, in Poland for the Minel Drum Festival, I took a little time afterwards and did some sightseeing just on my own. And yeah. it sort of occurred to me once I got off the train from Warsaw down into Krakow that pff, I did not know any Polish. I mean, not, not even the way to like ask for a restroom. And I mean, this is probably a typical American thing, but like when I've gone to other countries, I've tried to at least learn a few sentences to politely let them know, excuse me, I don't know your language. Do you know English? Can you please, you know, if you give them a little, they'll take it as being polite and then they'll try and help you. But yeah, definitely, definitely. Even in Poland, I mean, it was weird. I, the way that I gathered it was that the younger people, if they know another language, they know English. But the older people, if they know another language, it's Russian. Is that right? Of course. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And to say, like, uh, if you're in the city center, you're perfectly fine with English. It's just when you go a little bit outside and, you know, you have to deal with um, older people, they will not speak any English. Some of them do speak German because it's a neighbor country and it was quite common that they speak more German than um, English. Mm, interesting. Well, when you've been yeah. on tour with uh, in the past with Decapitated and now with Septic Flesh, aside from the language, how is it navigating the cultural differences between yourself and your band members? Um, yeah, it's, I have to agree that, uh, between Polish guys and Austrian guys and Greek guys, there is definitely a difference in the way we talk in the way, um, we do normal things. Um, but to be honest, I always try to be like a cool guy, try not to create any problems. And, um, Definitely with the Polish guys, there was more of like, there was more party involved, even though I'm not drinking any alcohol, but, you know, Slavic people do like to party. And um, with the Greek guys, they just, uh, they're more, how to say, they're the kind of guys that hug you immediately and they're like having loud conversations because they're from the South, you know, same with Italians. So... They sometimes scream at each other and you think they're having a fight, but it's the opposite. They're just <laughs> having a normal conversation. And me as the Austrian, I'm completely like, oh my God, this is like a fight. They're going to break up and uh, there's no band anymore. But honestly, it's just uh, a normal discussion, which, you know, they just talk a bit louder. And for me, I enjoy that, that I have sometimes some sort of a privacy that I do not understand everything. You know, when you're 24 hours together on the tour bus for six weeks, then uh, every privacy, and I mean even by not understanding everything they talk about, this is also a privacy because, you know, I don't, my brain doesn't listen to that. Yeah. So I can, you know, I can chill next to them and they're having a conversation about whatever, and I'm just like, all right, let them do their thing, and I'm, I'm chilling right here. That's actually so, got to be pretty nice uh, to be able to tune it out, you know, not have to listen to all, you, you're hearing conversation, but you're not really understanding it. So, yeah, I can see how that would be. Correct. Getting away without even having to get away. Um, yes, yes. Now, uh, as far as Polish bands go, you've also worked with Behemoth before, correct? Yeah, I helped out. It was back in 2013. And um, I played, I think, around 30 shows. Usually it was planned to have just six shows uh, during the summer. They're summer festivals. But the recovery of Inferno, their um, original drummer, uh, it took longer, and uh, so they needed someone else to keep playing, and it, they were happy in the way I played. So they asked me, okay, can you do the Asian tour? I said, yes, of course. And then it was like, can you do the Polish tour or the Poland tour? I said, yes, of course. So I started to play in summer and ended around in the winter, and around 30 shows, yeah. 
Wow. I, I saw those guys here in Nashville with John Rice playing drums for them. And Ah, um, uh, yeah. Dude. Amazing guy. Oh, yeah. Great guy, great drummer. It looked like a really fun gig to be on. It looked The music was great. It just it looked like a lot of fun. Yeah, it's, you know, for me it was different than, for example, Decapitated. I would say the biggest difference is just the stage presence. You know, with Decapitated it was always like you have to nail, like you have to be a, an amazing musician. It doesn't matter what outfits you wear. There's not this theatrical thing involved yeah but with behemoth it was like all right you have to be an amazing musician but you also have to wear corpse paint how <laughs> you present yourself on stage you know there's <clears> fire <throat> we also had fire and you know it was my first time playing with fire and it's just kind of crazy in a small venue which is already pretty hot and sweaty and then they just turn on those inverted crosses and just they, they burn through a whole song and you just feel like a barbecue chicken it's crazy <laughs> Well, that so. brings me to a question I've got regarding the, the death metal and the black metal communities. Okay. So, so the imagery uh, in these communities, you know, what they put on their album covers and their T-shirts and, and their stage clothes and all that, it, at its mildest, it would be called pagan. And at its most extreme, it would be <clears throat> just, you know, flat out satanic, which whatever, it's cool. It's just part of the imagery. Um, Correct. Now... But the actual musicians that you work with in that world, I get the feeling that they're probably like the sweetest, kindest guys that when they're not in their corpse paint and they're not on tour uh, partying hard, they're bringing flowers home to their loved ones. They play with their kids. They go do the grocery shopping at Aldi. Or do they actually like live alone in the forest with nothing but a torch and a knife? <laughs> I think the second option is really like at the tiniest percentage possible. There are some people like this, you know, that you would say... They are not really a fan of, you know, talking with other people and they like to stay somewhere alone and even believe in all the satanic stuff. But that's so small. It's, as you said, the opposite. From my experience, most of these guys, you know, the crazier they look, the sweeter they are. And we are just like normal people. And um, yeah, we like to hang out and we do our groceries, you know. <laughs> We, yeah. yeah, of course, we spend time with the kids. And as you said, we're just normal people. And when you go on stage and you put on corpse band, it definitely is like stepping into a different reality and in a different character. Let's put it like this way. It was the same with Behemoth. When we just put on the corpse band, I could tell that there was a different chemistry between us. And it was also the way everybody was talking and walking and behaving it was definitely different than off stage so this is like stepping into a different persona a different character and it's part of the thing but um most of the guys are super cool guys you know yeah i imagine so i imagine the guys that live alone in the forests with the torch and the knife those guys <laughs> probably aren't really gigging too much you know at that point no, when you're that's... doing that kind of a thing you, you maybe you're not socially adept and so you probably couldn't get a gig in the first place no, I think those are the guys that just do the studio work thing, that just drop out an album a right. couple of years in between. So, yeah. Now, speaking of normal stuff, um, I was impressed to see that you've actually got a main Coon for a cat. And uh, <laughs> okay. we have uh, the cat that we have. She's, I know she's part Maine Coon um, because she has all the traits of a Maine Coon. She's just yes. not as big. Um so I was surprised to see that you guys have uh, that breed of cat over in Europe. Um, I mean, absolutely. Yeah, that's absolutely. that's really cool. How how much does he weigh? Um, he weighs. I just know it in kilo. I don't know. You have to do the math your own. Uh, but he's around ten to eleven kilo. That's more than some small dogs. And um, yeah, he's a big boy and. The whole Maycoon thing, he's actually from Poland, from a Polish breed, but it's uh, very common nowadays. So everywhere in every country you have cat breeders that have Maycoons. They're quite expensive, but definitely, uh, and the Russians, the Russians love cats and this specifically Maycoons and Sphinx cats. And yeah, the same goes for Polish people, you know, a lot of Maycoons. And how old is your Maycoon? Um... His name is Smaug, so I named him also because he looks kind of like the dragon from The Hobbit, and I just thought this is kind of... It fits. 
but he's a sweetheart, you know, he's just this huge fat dummy cat <laughs> and he's, um, eight years is going to be in this year. Oh, wow. Okay. So, so I just did the math. Uh, 10 kilos is roughly 22 pounds. Yes. So, yeah, that's a big cat. Um, ours is. Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> no. like two cats combined. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I love the name too, Smog. That's that's perfect. Fits um, right, but oh, but you yeah. know he has one million names because every day I create a different name for him, whatever comes into my mind. But his official name is Smaug, and yeah, he's a fat sweetheart. And yeah, I, I love cats. I mean, I love all kinds of animals, but cats I always. You know, I always had cats, and yeah, I got this guy, and he's he's really cool. He's a good companion. Now, when you're on tour, who takes care of him? The family. So oh. it's um, dad or mom or my sis or some friends. Now, for example, while I'm here, a friend of mine is stepping by and giving him food and cuddles and stuff. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, I have to ask here, you've had a really interesting career so far where you've played for different bands on the road and in the studio. And yeah. if a young drummer came to you and asked what he needed to do to be able to prepare for a career like yours... Is there any advice off the top of your head that you would give him? Yeah, there are a couple of things. I think it's really important to be yourself and try to have some sort of an identity when you play. And because I realized, or this is my point of view, that if you look at the drummers which are famous and who are out there, um, doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be the fastest or most complex drummer, but... Um, let's say Mario Dublantier from Kuchira is really a big influence for me and, you know, and a, a great drummer. He, he has this character, the same is for Ilo Casagrande and so many other, Thomas Hake from, from uh, Meshuga. All these drummers, they have this unique style. I know it's very difficult to, to find your own sound, but I always try to do that, you know, play my style and then another thing is it's it's not easy to step into this business for me I had the chance to join Decapitated back in 2010 it was and I knew that this is my window and I have to take this chance so there's not always an opportunity to get your foot inside this uh, business but as a young drummer if you have the possibility and if you see this window opening for you then you have to take this chance because it's not happening so often and you have to treat everyone with respect and give every day 100 percent this is a couple of tips well when you found the window of opportunity for the decapitated gig how did that window present itself how did they find out about you um, through YouTube. So it was, uh, YouTube was a really cool thing back in the days because it was, uh, there were barely any drummer videos out there. So I started my YouTube channel in 2007. So I just figured out there's YouTube and I saw a couple of other videos and then I thought like, okay, I can do the same. I, I was recording myself, uh, for practice, you know, like to, to, to see how I play and how it sounds. So I just uploaded those videos and they kind of gained uh, more views and people wanted more um, songs. And I did cover videos. And <laughs> one of the songs was a, a Decapitated song. And this was more or less the guys from Decapitated, even the drummer who passed away, Vitek. So it's the, it's the brother of Vogue, the guitar player. Even he saw that video um, and Vogue told me that later that they both watched my video. And I think that was also the main thing why uh, the guitar player contacted me when he wanted to restart the band. He was like, okay, I know this kid from YouTube. Maybe let's just write to him on MySpace because it was MySpace times. And um, let's ask if he wants to do some kind of audition and if he would be up to play in a band. So YouTube has always been, for me, a way to present myself. And also, many bands are watching it. It's not only, let's say, the, the normal people, the peasants, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like, it's the bands watch it themselves as well. And um, yeah, YouTube was, for me, the start of this. Well, that totally answered a question I had about whether or not social media has helped you get work. Aside from ah, 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was, yeah. well, what made me think of that was that I remember back when Slipknot was looking for a new drummer, or the Joey yes. Jordanson had left the band and everything was quiet, like, who's going to join Slipknot? Um, I think that you had some videos that you put up of you playing some Slipknot tunes. Yes. Now, was that directly to try and get them to see what you could do, or was that just because of your love from Slipknot? Because I know you're a crazy old school Slipknot fan. I mean, you've got like the old Joey, you've got like an old Joey Jordanson outfit and mask from way back when that you created. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So let's dive into that topic. So I'm a huge Slipknot fan, and definitely this was, I think, the main band that brought me into this genre and this kind of music. And Joey Jordison's drumming, especially back in the days with all the crazy head banging and this, you know, when they were young and full of power, it was just craziness. And um, yeah, so I was a so called maggot back in the days. <laughs> um, and the whole thing with, uh, so my whole drumming was heavily influenced by Joey Jordison. I think you can tell us the way I play. And um, with the Slipknot thing, you know, I just finished with Behemoth. That was 2013. So I had no band. I just finished with Behemoth. And then this news popped up that, yeah, Joey Jordison is no longer part of Slipknot. And then I was like, you know what? I just got the gig for Behemoth. I know it's crazy. It's totally crazy idea, but who knows? Who knows? Maybe it's possible to have a chance to play with Slipknot. So I talked with a friend of mine and he was like, you know what? I think it's a cool idea if you would just record some videos. Like, just try it out as it used to be. Record some videos, show what you can do. And he had um, one studio day booked at a friend's studio. And he said, like, I give you this. It's in one week. Go go learn some songs, and we're gonna we're going to record some videos. I said okay, right. And then I recorded uh, people equal shit and Eyeless, and um, this kind of videos they blew up. You know, somehow the YouTube algorithm catched it, and somehow also the whole metal media like it took just a week and it was spreading everywhere. And I just. I never really thought that I have actually a chance because, to be honest, if a band like Slipknot, which is its own country, if it's, it's like its own government, you know, <laughs> they for sure, they for sure had already Che in the background and everything with the management, blah, blah, blah. But I was like, let's try. And so I posted these videos and to be honest, I never got uh, <clears throat> any response from the band or anything because some people thought I actually did, but I didn't. But for me, that was not a problem. For me, it was still a, a win-win situation because now I'm in Septic Flash. I'm really happy. Um, the videos got, I think, each of them 3 million views over the time. So, And if I would be in Slipknot, it would be also a win. So for me, it was, it was cool this way. Did you actually wear the Slipknot outfit that you made? Would you wear that to Slipknot shows? No, um, it's too small. There was... I did that because, you know, I was a teenager and I was a fan. And I said to my grandmother, even like, I, I went to some, um, oh, I don't know what is this store called, like some Home Depot style. And I was buying this, this suit, you know, and I was like to my grandmother, hey, can you, can you uh, put some patches on and can we change it? So we made the custom made, um, so my granny actually made a custom made Slipknot jumpsuit. <laughs> Um, and of course I had to have some self-made masks because at that time you couldn't buy them, but I never was wearing that to a show. It was just, you had to have it as a real Slipknot guy. And, uh, for the videos, no, I just, uh, normal outfit, but I was really overwhelmed by the, the response I got from the fans. So, or fans, you know, there was so many people loved the sound and the way I play and many said I should, I should be the drummer, but the, I'm, I'm really happy that Che has the job because he puts the energy in this band that it needs, so he kills it. Yeah, yeah, he does great. But okay, before we end the Slipknot discussion, you got to tell me, this outfit, did you just like come to the breakfast table in it? Once you made it, did you just hang it on the wall or would you actually put it on and say like walk around the house in it? No, I didn't walk around the house. <laughs> But to be honest, I would have I put it on I put it on for a couple of you know practice sessions and then I realized this is so uncomfortable and so hot and I was admiring the guys even more how they could 
play a show in this outfit. So I tried it out, discovered that it's way too hot and too small. And then ever like since then, it's just hanging in the closet. <clears throat> Memories, you know. Dude, speaking of it being hot and uncomfortable, my only real Slipknot story is that way, way back in the day, I was going to visit a couple of our artists whose bands were on tour with Slipknot at the time. And I had known that Joey Jordanson was a real big King Diamond fan. And I had this oh. old King Diamond... And I'm an old, like, huge old school King Diamond fan. So... I had this old Abigail, or no, it was a Them uh, concert shirt from one of the shows back then, and it was way too small for me at this point. And he's a small guy. So I brought it to the show, and I had one of our artists introduce me to Joey, and I gave him the shirt. And he was so stoked on getting this King Diamond shirt that he's like, dude, during the show, come up behind the drum riser, just hang out up there. There's a... Um, We've got like the, the scrim that hangs down behind the horseshoe like, behind me, so no one will be able to see. You can hang out my drum tech. Just hang out there. We'll do shots in between songs, and I'm going, <laughs> okay. So I go up there when the show starts. I'm hanging out under the drum riser right behind him, and I can see him because like you can see through the, the scrim curtain, but you can't really – the crowd couldn't see us. So yeah, I'm with the drum tech, but there's like a bucket. Of, and a mop in the bucket and there's hot water and some, some soap in there. I'm like, what is that? And there's all these shots that are just lined up. And I got the feeling that the shots that were lined up weren't because I was there. That's just like the way things were. It was like standard operating procedure. And so then in between songs, when, when they wouldn't go immediately into the next song, he'd jump off the drum kit. He'd come back there. He'd lift up his mask and he'd throw up on the ground. And that's what the mop and the bucket were for because um, he was just so hot. And then after he'd throw up, he'd take a shot, which I thought, oh, my gosh, that's insane. Um, it is. <laughs> but then he would go right back out and just nail it. Anyway, it was really bizarre, but it was really cool to watch. It was like, it was fun. Yeah, it is bizarre. And uh, thanks for sharing this kind of unique Thing. I mean, I there are there's footage out there that Joe is puking around quite often before shows. Maybe there was a thing. Maybe he can do that on you know on the spot. But which which year was that? Oh, dude, great question. Um, the years run together for me. It's sad to say. Um, <laughs> if I had to guess, I would say this was maybe around. I don't know. It's somewhere between 2006 and 2010. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, that's 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 okay. That's okay. I'm not even really sure. It's so strange. Um, there's a period of time <laughs> once I started working at Minel where the years kind of blended together. Um, <laughs> Why is that? <laughs> because time is flying, or because of too many shots behind the stage? <laughs> no. Well, time is flying. Um, but moving on from Slipknot. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask. Um, now, your band Septic Flesh, you guys just put out your first live DVD. Correct. And um, tell us the name of the DVD. It's Inferno Symphonica, if I'm correct. And then um, we recorded this whole thing in Mexico City. You did and this it, last just, year, February of 2019, right? We did this on the 2nd of February 2019, and uh, we released it this year just... Uh, like uh, two weeks ago. And why is it so special? Because we played the first time with a full orchestra live. The thing is with Septic Flesh, we always have a real orchestra in our albums. So we hire mostly the Prague Symphony Orchestra or like it's not the Symphony Orchestra, but it's, it's a, an orchestra in Prague that records a lot of soundtracks. And we hire them to have real orchestra. But life, you can imagine that it's difficult, you know, money-wise and the whole organization. It's just impossible to do that every day. But it has always been a dream because the band was made for this scenario. And then we got the offer from a Mexican promoter and he said, like, you know what? Maybe we can do that. It would be a dream of my own to, to have Septic Flesh here and play with an orchestra. And we kept the contact. And then we really made it happen. And the crazy thing is that it's uh, not only a full orchestra, but it has, we included a kids' choir and an adult choir. So let's say it was 
more than 100 people on stage, which is crazy. Mm. And so we, we played the show. Um, we had a preparation for sure, like half a year before, because we had to make sure that all the scores are correct, that there's no mistakes. We had to adjust the click tracks so that every, like the conductor played with the click track and I played with the click track. And we had to make sure that everything is correct. But then when we came to Mexico, we had only three rehearsals. And to be honest, only one rehearsal with the whole band. Otherwise, it was always me and the orchestra. And then it was showtime. It was really crazy. So we had this really nice theater in the middle of Mexico City. It's a capacity of 3,000 people. It was sold out. And then it was like, okay, we're going to play with a full orchestra in front of 3,000 people and we're going to shoot a DVD. And I was like, wow. So a lot of things at once. Um, I do remember certain certain parts of the show, but definitely my whole body and brain went into survival mode and just, you know, tried to not make any mistakes because we had only one, one take and one shot. Ugh. I realized this afterwards. When I came off the stage, all the like intensity it just came down and I was like, all right, what just happened? And then it really hit me and then I could, I could feel how tense I was, but everything was working fine. And uh, now we released the DVD and it was definitely a milestone for us. So very unique uh, experience. And yeah, if you guys want to check it out, it just got released uh, through Season of Mist. There's a live DVD out there. Yeah. Can it be downloaded as well? Uh, I think downloaded, not... I, I'm not sure it might be that there is uh, the full thing on YouTube already by Season of Mist, mm. but I don't know exactly what was the plan, but we have it in Blu-ray and a normal DVD. So yeah. did anybody make any mistakes? Um... A little bit, but we kept them inside because, you know, it's one one performance and that's it so the drums were pretty okay i listened to it and it was like yeah that's fine um but we knew that we have only one recording and it's a live performance we just play certain things different but that was not such a big mistake that we had to start the song again or i didn't even lose a stick or anything so it was barely any problems so yeah yeah, man, really, I got to say hats off to you for being able to drive that train because um, that is yeah. a lot to do. I mean, the pressure alone has got to be insane to do something like that. Yeah, you cannot imagine like when you go on stage and we had this big curtain in front of us. So it would be that because it's impossible to have the curtain open and let 100 people walk on stage. Uh, you know, everybody had to sit down and I was really high up. So I was on the highest spot, more or less having the best seat in the house. And I would have eye contact with the conductor because we both actually, we were, we were kind of the pilots of the whole show because I had to push the click track, but he had to check the orchestra if everybody's okay. So I had to wait for his signal to be fine and then I pushed um, the click track and to go on stage with the curtain closed and we do start the intro and then at one point we couldn't hear anything because the people were screaming so loud through the curtain and even now talking about this I get shivers you know it was this crazy experience <laughs> wow so wait a minute so you've got the click going and then the crowd starts going nuts and it was hard to hear the click itself because everybody's screaming it was hard to hear the orchestra at this point, but um, not a click I heard because of the in-ears, but I just remember this, it was like a wave, you know, and because of the curtain and it was like swelling up, swelling up and it was super loud, crowd screaming and um, then the curtain opened and we started to play and I don't know what my heart rate was there, but for sure <laughs> pretty high. I mean, I guess if you if you know the arrangements, you got a click track going it really doesn't matter if you can completely hear the orchestra or not at that point because you know you've got the map in your brain. You know where to go. Yeah, sure. It's muscle memory, and I wanted to be as... I wanted to play as usual. You know, I, I didn't want to get too much mm, mm, from the outset, not being distracted or anything, because I wanted to be or I had to be as solid as possible. 
So I prefer to be in my own world almost. Um, I can enjoy it now when I watch the DVD, but back then I wanted to have almost no difference to another show. Also, we did a US tour right before. So we had around three weeks of practice. You know, we were, we were in good shape. And then we flew to Mexico, we rehearsed. But Mexico City is really high up the altitude. So it was like crazy to to play there and practice there. And we practiced in Toluca, which is even higher up. And I could feel that, yeah, the air is a little bit thinner there, but you know, you have to have to do it. Nine o'clock in the morning, we went to the to the practice space. And then one th- funny thing I want to mention. Um, so we arrive in Toluca and we wanted to check out what's going on with the rehearsals. So we drive to the rehearsals and the orchestra is practicing. And then the conductor is just like saying, drummer, drummer is here. I said, yeah, he's here. Okay. We want to play with you. And they're like, now, but I have to set up. Yeah. Set up. So I was like, they were practicing and you know, they're like machines. They start at nine o'clock and they finish at noon and then they go home. Uh, so I was setting up the drums uh, as quickly as I could. And I was like, okay, let's, let's practice this song. And I started to play and then everybody starts to turn their head in my direction. I'm like, okay, what's going on? Something is wrong. Then they start to take out the phone and they started to film and make pictures because they couldn't, it's the first time that they saw a metal drummer or heard a metal drummer. <laughs> they couldn't believe what was going on there. And I was of course way too loud because classical instruments, especially strings, not the brass section. The brass is super loud and percussion, but the strings and wood wings, they're quite quiet. And um, so it's me playing as usual, you know, trying to get over the wall of guitars, but there were no guitars. So I'm playing and, and then after one song, the conductor says like, please more quiet, more quiet. And then I had to play as quiet as I could with two B drumsticks, you know, with trees in my hand. And, you know, in order to play fast, sometimes you need the rebound and you need the power of like, when you hit hard, you can play faster. So I had to play as quiet as I could, but still play the same thing. So it was funny that they were so surprised by a drummer doing all these crazy things, the double bass and, you know, blast beats. And so they had to take pictures and videos. (laughs) Wow. So wait a minute, in the show, did you also have to play as quiet as possible? And now in the show, I was like, no, I'm going to play as usual. Um, but we put some, this plexiglass, if this is the word, around me. Yeah, like, the clear sonic panels. Yeah. Yes. So we tried to do that. And I was really far in the back as far as possible. But this this problem in the rehearsal space was that it was a very um, bad acoustic in this room. And this uh, the sonic panels, you know, this this glass thing, they reflected back on the wall and then to them in the front. And we had a delay. So until it reached the conductor's ear, there was almost, no, not a second, but a half a second difference. And everybody thought I'm playing out of the click, but it wasn't. It was because of the room thing. Mm. So yeah, it was uh, quite an interesting thing. And we kept rehearsing like three, three days in a row like that. I was in the mornings play with the orchestra, and then on the last day, we, we practiced the whole band together. And that was showtime. Wow. I mean, dude, I know you said you were a little, you had the shivers just talking about it. It makes me nervous just talking to you about <laughs> it because, yeah, for obvious reasons. I have, But like I said before, hats off to you. That's a crazy amount of respect I have for you actually you. pulling that off. Wow. Um, I had to. I mean, yeah, you have no choice. It's your, it's your job. Correct. Um, who was the person that thought in your band, like when the person that thought of it brought the idea to you, I'm sure immediately all of that pressure flashed through your brain and you probably looked at him like, asshole, God. <laughs> and, and not an asshole, but I was like, okay, is this really going to happen? I mean, there was the excitement included, but definitely right after the excitement, there was this scenario, okay, how, how many times can I fuck up? And then, oh, we're going to shoot the DVD. Oh, okay, so <laughs> we have proof of everything. Oh, nice, thank you. Yeah. So it was, now looking back, I probably would say it would have been better to just play the first show um, without the DVD. Or maybe, I think it would have been possible to have two shows in a row because 
people came from all around the world for this thing, you know, septic flesh and classical orchestra. People came from Europe just to see that. Wow. So I think we could have done two shows in a row in the same place. And they booked the venue 24 hours. So at midnight, they started to set up the stage and the light and the cameras. And it was quite stressful. And they had the original plan to play the full set on the afternoon, like as a final practice. But I told them, guys, the set is one and a half hours long. You want me to play that twice on one day, like full power? I'm going to die later on. Yeah. So we said, no. Also, with meet and greet, it was impossible. And of course, things were late. So it was quite stressful adding up to the already stressful situation. So I would have preferred to just play the show and maybe if you would repeat it, then have uh, the DVD shot. But we wanted to do it all at once. And yeah, I remember that sitting in the lobby like a year before this whole thing happened, so around 2018-ish. And our guitar player said like, yeah, we might really do that with full orchestra. And I was like, all right. I hope we really practice a lot because we cannot mess up. <laughs> yeah. Well, moving on with Septic Flesh, um, you guys start recording your album at the end of this month. So a, a new album, you start recording one at the end of this month. That's correct, right? That's correct. Okay. We already started with the guitars. Now, how did you guys write this? When did you write this? Was it prior to COVID or was it during? Um, it was mostly, everything was done before. And to be honest, we started collecting ideas, I think even at the end of 2018, um, Seth, our guitar player and, vo uh, sorry, our vocalist and me, we were starting already trying to collect riffs. I think none of them really survived. It was a lot of work because we wanted to make as usual, the best album as possible. So... Um, but we really started to work um, way more after our last show, which was in December 2019. And then from January on, it was like full songwriting mode. And um, yeah, so I started to try to come up with riffs because I'm also involved in the songwriting. And if I had ideas with guitar parts, I sent them over. Of course, I'm not the main songwriter, it's the other guys. But it's like um, our guitar player writes certain songs, our vocalist writes songs. Um, and he's also the guy who has the overview and he's very good with the arrangement. And our guitar player is the guy who writes for the orchestra because he, he uh, studied classical music in London. And he's the guy who writes all the scores for the orchestra. And so we started from January on. Um, and then the whole COVID thing happened and the original plan was to start recording drums first. That's how you usually do that. But uh, that was planned to be happening in May and um, Sweden has been declared a high risk zone, still is. So no flights going there, now they have. Um, and we moved it to next week. The plan is that I fly next week to Sweden to Fascination Street Studios, and I'm going to record with Jens Bogren, who did also our last album. I'm going to record with him the drums. And if everything goes well, I keep my fingers crossed, I'm going to fly next week. Is this the yeah. first flight you'll have taken since being uh, grounded from the pandemic? Correct. So I have been all the time at home. I didn't fly and... I will not fly after this also. You know, I'm not planning to do any holidays or fly somewhere while this whole thing is happening. So this is like a business travel. I want to have this album done. And to be fair, it's pretty cool now that it got uh, postponed because I had more time to practice with the songs and really get into them. So I'm playing them every day and repeating them over and over again. So they are basically in my DNA and I can work over parts. It just feels more comfortable. So I think when I go to Sweden, it will be not an easy piece of cake, but it's going to be easier because I know what to do. It's just playing that tight. But uh, it's very cool with Jens Bogren. He's the guy who likes to work in the mornings as me. We get up at seven and then we start at eight o'clock and we, we are like machines. You know, we start with the first song, then I change all the skins 
he edits the song, then we do the second song, then it's lunch break, I change the skins again, then we do a third song, change the skins again, maybe do a fourth song on that day, and then we go sleep, and the next day the same. Mm. That's cool. Yeah. Now, because of there being no real plan in place for when bands can tour again, how do you guys, do you guys have any sort of game plan or ideas for how to support this record? Yeah, it's, it's, you know, we want to push back the release. It is supposed to be out this year, but it's not going to happen. Mm. From what I know is from the label and management, we probably going to wait until there's going to be some sort of shows because we don't want to burn this album. You know, it would be a pity to do that by releasing an album while you actually cannot promote it on the road. Right. And we we don't have the stress from the record label, which is cool. So we we really work on every detail and we just record it as we can. Now we started with guitars in Greece, so we have the final guitars. Probably while I will be in Sweden, they're going to start recording vocals in Greece. An orchestra is going to happen in September, beginning of September in Prague, Czech Republic. Uh, and um, I don't know if I can be there to listen because of the whole COVID thing. It might be that our guitar player will be there through Skype and they will just record on their own. So the plan for now, I think, is going to be next year, beginning of next year, but depending how's the situation. So this is the plan for now for this album. Show-wise, this year is gone. We will not book anything in this year. Next year is still a question sign. Um, we have to see how is the situation. We have to see how many venues surviving that. And then if the venues survive and we are good to go, literally every band in this universe, no matter which music genre is going to play or wants to play. Yeah. Well, I have to ask, yeah. have you been making, how have you been making the most out of the, the forced time at home and being off tour because of this? It, it might be too early to say, but can you think of anything particularly positive that's come from it for you? Um, I play more than I have ever done, I think. If I look back the last months or since January, it's been super busy and then this whole COVID thing happened. But uh, for me, even during the lockdown, we were, we were not allowed to meet up with people, but I was alone in the practice room. So everybody was staying home and I was going every day to the practice room playing. Nothing has changed for me. I was just playing, playing, playing. And the positive thing is that I think because I play so much, I can also focus on, you know, certain things that are disturbing me in my playing. Let's say if they're uncomfortable tempos or maybe I can work on my technique, like perfect it and feel more comfortable. And I just, um, that was kind of my, my way of dealing with the situation, just playing and doing what I love, do it even more. And I was busy, you know, I was busy with session jobs. I was busy with making new videos. And now I'm busy with Septic Flash. And um, Norbert from Mindel called me to do some videos. So, so far, things are happening, right? But um, after the Sweden recording thing, there is still a big black hole. I don't know what's going to happen afterwards. Probably I'm going to keep practicing. So, as I said, I'm, I'm playing more than I did before. I do more sports than I did before. And I do see the benefits. Yeah. So that's the, the positive part of it in this mm. whole mess. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I forgot to ask you a question about the recording process. Uh, playing double bass, when you record, do you record with two kick drums or with a double pedal? Um, if it's two kick drums, do producers sometimes ask you to play with just a double pedal? Uh, I have done both, but I would say 90% of the time it's two kick drums and they prefer two kick drums for the simple reason that you have left and right kick separated. So it's easier afterwards for the processing. Also, you know, my left leg is not as strong as the right one. So it's easy to just make the left kick louder, right? Um, and it's just easier for for the producers and for myself as well. I just... I'm not a big fan of the, um, the double bass pedal because of this um, drive shaft that does add some weight. And if you're used to play always with 
two singles, you do feel the difference. I mean, I can do it, but it's just better this way. The only downside is transportation wise now, for example, for these videos here for mine, like carried my drums and with the car. Yeah. And two bass drums, they just take so much space. It's really a pain in the ass. You know? mm. <laughs> this is the downside, but recording wise, I prefer it way more. Yeah. So two kicks always. And yeah, producers are happy with that too. They don't have a problem. <clears throat> So you drove up to Meinl from Austria with your drums? Yes, it's, you know, it's Europe. The distances are not so crazy like in the U.S. So I will tell you that I drove six hours. That's for you, like, just around the corner probably, right? <laughs> no, no, I mean, yes and no. Six hours, it's like, okay, I can do six hours. But yeah, yeah but if you drive six hours in Texas, you're still in Texas, right? <sighs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's exactly right. If I was on, so I'm in Tennessee, the state of Tennessee, and if I was on the far eastern side, where I grew up, and I wanted to go to the far western side where I was born, in Memphis, uh, it would take six hours to get from one side of the state just to the other side of the state. Correct. And they still speak English there, and they still <laughs> are Americans, and it's still the same state, you know? Here it's different. You drive six hours, different language, different culture. Yeah. So. Yeah. Now, when, when you come up from Austria and you're coming into Germany, I mean, it's... You're still speaking German, so there's Correct. that barrier that's removed. But is it just painfully obvious to you that you're in Germany and you're not in Austria anymore? I mean, is it, you know what I mean? Or does, are there a lot of things that still seem somewhat familiar? Um, there's a difference in the behavior of people, but not that I would say it's so crazy. Let me describe it this way. You have Irish people, right? Yeah. And then you have people which are from the mainland England. So let's say you have people from London and you have people from Ireland or uh, Scottish guys. So they both or all of them speak English, but the way of, you know, how they are, this is the difference. Mm -hmm. And it's the same with Austrians and Germans. We do understand each other. Of course, some dialects and certain words we cannot understand. Yeah, Austria is a very small nation. If you look it up, how it looks like, it looks like a chicken wing or something like this. It's tiny. We have only 8 million people. And Germany is a monster country. You know, it's, a, it's huge. It's the big brother. And um, yeah, so Germans tend to be more straightforward with certain things. So Austrians can get this in a wrong attitude, which Germans actually don't mean that way, but they're just way more straight to the point, while Austrians might be talking a little bit around, you know, blah, 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 try not to offend anyone. Mm, but interesting. It's, it's, yeah, it's not so crazy. I think the best example would be between your island um, and mainland of England. So there's a difference for sure between those people. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Well. I got one last question, and then I'll let you go. Um, here's your chance for complete shameless self-promotion. I mean, now is your time to really <laughs> sell the shit out of yourself. So okay. tell us about your own musical projects, uh, how you write the music for them, and where all of us can support and buy the music. Okay, let's go. Let's bring it. All right, <laughs> so for those people that don't know, uh, I do write also my own music. I have a solo project which is called Krim, very genius name, but it's easy to find. So same as my stage name, Krim, it's Krim the same. And um, I already put out three records and it's the, the whole plan behind this solo project is 100% creativity and 100% control over this thing. So I don't have any record label or anything involved in that. I do music whenever I can and I want and the music I like. And then I release it and I just hope that somebody likes it. But the response is not bad. So I did three albums where I record and write every instrument except vocals. But so I write guitar, I play guitar, drums, obviously. And you can find my stuff. Uh, I have a Bandcamp account for the, the digital downloads. Of course, I'm on Spotify, but we all know how this situation is with Spotify. It's easy to, to listen, but it's not really the best support. If you guys want to support, then Spotify is the last option. And if you guys want physical CDs, then you can buy this through my um, 
it's not Bandcamp, but it's Big Cartel. So it's Crim Big Cartel. I do have a store. You might it might take a little bit to to get packages to the states because of the whole COVID thing. So if somebody is ordering from the states, um, it will take a bit. But there you can buy the CD, the self release. And the idea is to, if I have nothing else to do in this year, maybe work on another solo album. Yeah, what else? Self-promotion. I think that's actually the best for my solo project. The other thing, Septic Flesh, obviously, you can find everywhere. But uh, yeah, solo project is only in the internet. What about online drum lessons? Do you offer those at all? Uh, Yes, online drum lessons, I do that. Um, Not all the time. It always depends on if I have time to do that. I would wish to have students where I can build up with them something, you know, most of the time it is just one hour with some, some person. And I would, I think it's nicer to, to have them on a regular basis and just build up together something. So I do, uh, give Skype lessons. Um, I do also session jobs depending on the music and if it's playable, because very often it's programmed drums, drums, which are pretty insane. (laughs) Um, yeah, so, uh, usually I post such information on my Instagram or my Facebook. And then if I'm looking for some session jobs or if someone is interested or online lessons, you will find it there. Okay, perfect. So they can find online lessons or session work through your Instagram or Facebook accounts. Exactly. And by the way, I want to mention that it's sometimes a big confusion. There is multiple facebook pages out there which there are many fan made pages so there is actually only two so it's crim for the solo project and you will easily identify that it's my solo project and for my drumming career as a drummer it's just crim drummer everything else kerem crim lechner fake so there's a bunch of fake um sites out there so in case you were writing to these people and you got no response, sorry, I, I cannot <laughs> check that. <laughs> we'll let it go this time. <clears throat> um, yes. <laughs> hey, man, Krim, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Um, I'm still getting over my nerves from the Mexico City show description. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, man, and enjoy. Th- thanks for coming to Minel Germany and filming videos for us and, and enjoy your evening there. And um, Thank you. Man, I really no, hope to get to see you sooner than later. <laughs> definitely. It's, it w- I mean, I'm afraid it will take a bit that you come here or the other way around. But as soon as this whole stupid virus is under control, then I would definitely look forward for a meeting again. Because the one time we met, it was really cool. And um, yeah, thank you very much for the podcast. I hope uh, the listeners are happy with the podcast and you guys enjoyed it. It's my pleasure. Yeah, watch out. uh, Not watch out. Look out for the the videos that are coming up. So we we got some cool performance videos. And yeah. Right on. Will do. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to Minel Radio. If you liked this episode, please head over to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. We would appreciate it very much. Thanks, and we'll see you soon.